Hey guys, in this particular video I'll be talking about kinetic energy and I'm going to derive the formula used for kinetic energy based off our definition of work. So we know work is defined as W is equal to the integral of our force vector dot dr. Where your force could be varying with time and it's the force acting on a particular object and dr is just your displacement vector dx, dy, dt in the x, y, and z directions. And as a quick refresher on this, let me just walk you through a very, very small example. So we've got a particular marble, let's say, and we've got a whole bunch of forces acting on this marble. It doesn't have to be one. We could have one force here, for example, one force here, and maybe another force, I know, something like that. And we wanted to calculate the total work done by all of these forces on this particular object. Well, first of all, it has to move somewhere. So so let's make the assumption that it's moved to another location like right here. And we wanted to find out the work done by all of these forces on this object to make the ball move over there. Well, as, as I showed in last example, what we could do is we could calculate the work done by this force, let's call it F1, add that to the work done by this force, let's call that F2, and add that to the work done by this force, let's call that F3, and sum all of those results up together and you'll get the total work done. Makes sense? Another way we could do it, however, is by calculating the net force. And the net force is going to look something like this, I'd assume. Let's make the net force look something like that. And the net force, as we probably know, is just the sum of all the forces. It's just going to be F1 plus F2 plus F3. And then what we could do with the net force is calculate the work done by that particular force, and that will be our total work done. That's another way we could like kind of shortcut the way of calculating the total work done by all the forces. But there's an even faster way you can do this, it turns out, and that's by rearranging the terms inside this integral sign to get something really quite interesting. And I'll show you how to do that right now. All you need to know are three important formulas. First of all, you need to know that force, the force acting on an object, is equal to the mass of that object times by the acceleration of that object. Another thing you need to know is acceleration is equal to the change in rate of velocity. So V is velocity and T is time in this case. And velocity itself is just the change in rate of position with respect to time. So that will just be dr dt in vector notation. Alright, using these three formulas we can rearrange this formula right here. And I'll show you exactly how to do that. So let me scroll down just a little bit so you can just see it. Alright, so work is equal to the integral of force dot dr. Well we know force is now equal to ma, so I'll put a brackets around that. m a, where m is just a scalar. And that's going to be dotted with dr. Well what's dr? Well using this formula right here what we could do is just multiply dt by both sides and you get this result. dt times our velocity vector is equal to dr. And we can do that because dt is just a scalar, right? It's just a number. So we can dot that with dr, which we just figured out was just dt v. All right, we're almost done. But now if we wanted to simplify this even further, what we could do is now um, factor out the a, we can, sorry, substitute the a, we could write an integral sign here, and that's going to be our, our mass scalar times by dv dt, dv dt, and that's going to be dotted with this beast right here, dt times by our velocity vector, right there. All right, now this may be a little bit difficult to solve, but it's really quite simple. M and DT are both scalars, and when you dot them, you can, you can do this the long way out by dotting them and go through the whole dot product um, if you wanted to, but you can actually factor out the scalars when you're dotting vectors. So what I'm going to do is you can factor out the DTs, and because it's going to be DT divided by DT, that's just going to be equal to 1, right? So these cancel off quite nicely, leaving you with a mass at the front. And assuming that mass is constant, so we're making that assumption, we can put the mass outside of the integral sign and leave that with dt, sorry, dv dot v. 
So recall that V just denotes our velocity, not our volume in this particular case. All right, well, this becomes quite simple. We know that our velocity in its most general form is just going to be equal to our velocity in our x direction times the i unit vector plus our velocity in the y direction times our j unit vector plus the velocity in the z direction times our k unit vector. Right? In other words, that's saying any velocity can just be broken down into its three-dimensional components. This also means, while I'm on the track of sorting this out, this also means that the magnitude of our velocity, the magnitude of our velocity is just going to be equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. All right. Now, I, I won't go into too much detail into how this was derived, but um, because that's really for your math class. But all you need to know, really, is that this is just derived from Pythagoras, in case you're interested. All right. Well, now we can actually substitute these particular things in, knowing that dv now is just going to be equal to, dv now, still a vector, is going to be equal to, well, what will it be? It will just be the differential of each of these individual scalar components. It will be dvx. It will be dvy and dvz. Consequently, you can simplify this expression now to be equal to your mass times the integral, and don't forget it's from states 1 to 2, of, well, what's dv? We just described it was dvx, dvy, and dvz. And that's dot product with, let me do this, it'll be vx, vy, vz. I think you're seeing where I'm going to go here. And if you scroll down just a little bit more, you're, you're going to see that this simplifies out to a nice scalar. So it'll be mass times the integral of 1 to 2 of vx dvx plus vy. Oops vy dvy plus vz dvz right and we know that the integral sign is distributive right so what we can do is we can actually distribute the integral sign to each of these individual terms so this will become the integral of vx dvx plus the integral of vy dvy plus the integral of vz dvz. And the limits of integration now will just be our initial velocity in our x direction. So this will be vx1, so our initial velocity in our x direction, to our final velocity in our x direction, which I'll just call vx2. And the limits of integration here will just be our initial velocity in our y direction to our final velocity in our y direction. And this will be our initial, I think you get the pattern here, our initial velocity in the z direction and our final velocity in our z direction. A little bit laborious to write out, but I think it's important to write it out anyway. Oh, and uh, I should also mention that the mass was distributive as well. So I'll just, put a, I'll just put a bracket around here to show that the mass is timesing each of these integral signs. All right, well, let's see if we can simplify this out more. This is actually quite a very simple integral to make. We know that the integral, the integral of x dx, recall, was just going to be x squared on 2 plus c. So that's exactly what we're going to use here. But this time, we have limits of integration, so the, uh, so the constant's going to cancel out. And you'll, I'll see, you'll see what I mean when I actually write it out. That'll be our mass. And I'll leave that factored out. Our mass times by a half vx squared. Actually, no, I'll, 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 I'll do it all in one step. I hope you guys, will, I won't lose you guys. This will be a half vx2 squared minus vx1 squared plus a half vy2 squared minus vy1 squared. And You've probably guessed it by now. It's going to be a half vz2 squared minus vz1 squared. And all these individual terms are times by your mass because the mass is at the front. 
Alright, well, we're almost done here, believe it or not. Um, this is a much more, I, I wouldn't call it simplified, but it's a very different way of expressing the total work done by the sum of all your forces on your particular object. Right? But perhaps there's a way we can simplify this even further rather than going through the laborious process of breaking down the velocity into the x, y, and z directions. And as it turns out, there is a way. Recall that right here, I, I found out that the magnitude of our velocity vector was just the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, right? That would imply then that the velocity of our, the, sorry, the magnitude of our velocity the magnitude of our velocity at, say, our initial starting point is just going to be equal to the square root of, well, it'll just be vx at its starting position squared plus vy at its starting position squared plus vz at its starting position squared. Right? So in other words, basically, uh, when, when this ball um, gets its forces acting on him, what you can do is just calculate the magnitude of the velocity as it starts moving. So like, it, well, I mean, it could be starting with a velocity, it could be at zero velocity for, for all we know, but all we need to know is its magnitude of its velocity. It could be here, for example, and that will be V1 in our particular case. I hope I'm not losing you with that. All right, let's scroll down. All right, well, that's the magnitude of velocity one, and the magnitude of velocity two isn't gonna be much different. So let me just copy it out rather than writing it over again. The magnitude of our second velocity is going to be very much similar, except it won't be vx1, vy1, and vz1. As you've probably guessed, it'll be vx2, vy2, vz2, right? So in other words, the magnitude of our velocity at our final point, when, we're, when we want to end the experiment, is just going to have a velocity in the x direction of vx2, uh, a velocity in the y direction of vy2 and a velocity in the z direction of vz2 and the magnitude of the total velocity of that velocity vector is just this expression right here. I hope I'm not losing you. I might actually do a video later about what the um, uh, explaining the magnitude of velocity is a little bit more but for now just um, take my word on this. And as such you can simplify this expression a whole lot more and I'll show you how to do that. If we factor out the halves and the m's we're left with this. It'll be vx2 squared plus vy2 squared plus vz2 squared minus, and I'll keep the minus factored, vx1 squared plus vx, sorry, vy1 squared plus vz1 squared. Right, all I've done is just um, rearranged what was in the middle of this slightly differently. Right? But it's really important to realize that after rearranging this, we can actually re-express this term right here as the magnitude of our velocity vector at our second point squared. Right? Just imagine, if we square both sides here, what happens? Well, the square root sign gets rid. It just, it just gets abolished, right? So you're left with just the vx2 squared, the vy2 squared, and the vz2 squared. So this is just the magnitude of our, of our velocity at our second point squared. Likewise, the stuff inside the brackets here is just going to be equal to the magnitude of our velocity at our first point squared. Consequently, we can rewrite this entire expression now as our total work done by all the forces on a particular object from point one to point two is going to be a half m times by the magnitude of our second velocity squared, or in other words, our speed at our second point, subtracted from our magnitude of our first point squared, or in other words, our speed at that particular point. Because the magnitude is just a scalar now. It's, it's, it's not a vector. When we take the magnitude, this is just a number, right? So th that's a scalar now. So in other words, direction isn't important, right? And this is, this, is our def th this is actually a formal proof for why work is equal to a half m times by the v2 squared minus v1 squared, where, where, where we're only interested in speeds, right? We're not interested in directions anymore. 
Consequently, it seems like a natural progression to introduce an interesting term here to describe this form of energy. And this is where physicists have actually defined kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, denoted by Ke or sometimes T, is equal to a half mv squared, where v is always a speed, not a vector in this particular case. So kinetic energy then was defined to be equal to a half mv squared in order to easily fit into our new simplified definition of work. Alright guys, in, in the next few videos I'm going to be introducing you guys to gravitational potential energy and the potential energy of a spring and I'll show you how that plays an interesting part to play with work and also the conservation of mechanical energy.